Thank you. Maybe I'll use a little extra of the time. I, I went to journalism school with Jeff, and I wrote this on deadline, so I actually, uh, I brought it. <laughs> so I lived with Jeff for about a year after journalism school, during which time I had a chance to learn about his extreme passion for efficiency that most people probably know, whether it's rerouting how subways should run or reprogramming his keyboard so he doesn't have to stretch his index finger for the T key. <laughs> He's a glutton for efficiency. So he introduced me to this great book called Enumeracy by the mathematician John Allen Paulos about how people could live much more logically and efficiently if they had any understanding of numbers and probability. There's a particular section about choosing a spouse. Paulo says you should withhold selecting a spouse until you've surveyed a wide sample. He suggests at least 25 people. And he, he goes through a fairly complex calculus-based proof to show that you should settle down with the first kind of heartthrob after you've met 37% of the people you'll ever meet. <laughs> Sounds a little practical for love, right? I know. But Paulos underestimated Jeff Novich. <laughs> Jeff wanted a bigger sample. So court, according to U.S. Census data, there are about 300,000 unmarried Jewish women between the ages of 20 and 30 in the United States. <laughs> Jeff's a friendly guy, but when I was living with him, there were only about three or four that he had sampled, I guess, on a regular basis. So that left 299,996. So this is back in 2005. Jeff started going to speed dating fairly regularly, so, and I think it's four minutes a person or something. I think he was usually gone for a few hours, and maybe met 25 people a night. He did that maybe 20 times or so. So they weren't all Jewish, but he also went to some matzo balls to make up for it. So that's about 500 more potential spouses met, leaving a mere 299,446 potential spouses to meet. Then one day I came home and saw that Jeff had created a computer program that would crawl various dating and social networking sites collect women who fit a rubric that he had created and drop their profiles into a page that only he could see. He had this down to a science. Certain height-weight ratio restrictions, particular combinations of hobbies and favorite movies. And he, he even programmed it to recognize phrases that indicated that a woman was actually a plant by the dating company to make the website look good and wasn't a real person. So he was able to eliminate all these plants. So he had moved from the realm of speed dating into hyperspeed dating. <laughs> so I made a little back of the envelope calculation. Jeff and I started living together in March of 2005. Based on close observation, I realized that he could sort about 4.6 women per minute, meet them virtually. So for about three hours each night, so that was around 832 potential spouses every day, sifted every day. That's 24,962 potential spouses met or virtually met every month. Then Jeff met Maddie on March 22, 2006, 12 months after the point I first noticed his efficient hyper-speed dating strategy. That meant that before that time, he'd met or virtually met 300,145 potential spouses, which you might recall is slightly more than the number of eligible single Jewish women in the United States. So I, I emailed Professor Paulos for his thoughts on this. He agreed with me that his theorems had not accounted for someone like Jeff Novich. That it was clear that Jeff had in fact screened and rated every potential spouse, and had certainly become the first human being on Earth to actually find his exact perfect match. Statistics no longer applied to Jeff Novich. So of course I liked Maddie right away, but Paulos suggested I come up with a test. So just to check the hypothesis that Jeff had in fact found the exact ideal mate in Maddie, so I hemmed and hawed and then it hit me. When we lived together, I often had to cajole Jeff into splitting our utility bills. Not an easy thing, as anyone who's lived with him knows. So each time he handed over his share of the money, he went to great pains to explain to me the actual physical pain he felt when he parted with a dollar. This, he described it as this burning sensation that started at the tips of his fingers and spread up to his arm. So I wasn't surprised when Jeff bought Maddie a moissanite ring instead of a real diamond. I was surprised, however, when Maddie changed her mind and Jeff actually sprung for the real diamond. They say love hurts, but based on Jeff's explanation of the pain of spending, I can't imagine the torture he endured. But he bought the ring anyway. If that's not true love, I don't know what is. Once again, Professor Paulos agreed. He extended his congratulations, as do I. <laughs> <laughs>